Okay, containers. I'm going to ask Simo, what even is a container? Can you let us yes. know what is a container? So a container, like the name apply, uh, implies, the name comes from the idea behind shipping containers. So about a bit of the history of why the container technology even exists is that uh, back in the day, uh, well, before the cloud days even began, uh, like like you know the cloud infrastructure in the internet, uh, people in the IT sector were wondering how can we ship our applications to different uh, different ports or different like compute systems somewhere in the internet, so that we can serve, give our let's say banking services or something like that. Uh, and previously, it was done either by by just installing multiple service uh, multiple servers or uh, using virtual machines but the virtual machines were back in those days especially they were slower so it was a bit of a like a pain for many people in the IT industry so what happened was that docker where the name doc is is already in the name uh, this company they created uh, with other uh, people from the linux uh, Linux like uh, field, they created this idea of a container. So it, it's like a it's a collaborative effort, but the Docker was really the killer product that got the whole ball rolling. And the idea is that you have this shipping container, basically. You have everything you need for whatever application you want, uh, everything you need, and you can put them into this kind of like a shipping container, and you can run it wherever you want in whatever like cloud infrastructure you want to use and it's it's easy to ship it around like you know these like standardized shipping content containers that you have on on trains in in ships in um in in trucks wherever like this because they're standardized and the way you operate these or move these around is standardized it's very easy to uh, ship them around the world and that's why they're so popular and basically, the idea was the same, that you should put your applications into these uh, shipping containers. Well, this might seem that, okay, like, okay, is it just like a storage format? Like, like a shipping container seems like it's, it's just like a storage format that you put your stuff inside the shipping container and that's it. But in the case of an obtainer, it's, it's more than that. And it's a, like a self-contained application that has like all of the tools, but when we're talking about containers, we we also mean like the runtime environment and the run, like when it, when the container is being run, when the application is being run, how you, can you like contain it in its own environment? So like when you run an application, where does the application run? It doesn't run on the, the machine itself, but it runs in its own like virtual world, and and this kind of idea that okay, the container is it's just not like storing the application. It's also the okay, I will encapsulate the whole application and whatever the application is doing into its own environment, and this is called the container. So the the way that the container like files are transferred are these so-called container images but and, and sometimes container can refer to also these container images but container as it's like traditionally known it it means the the running uh, service or running application that runs in its own world so if uh, if you Enrico scroll a bit down there's a picture or, or like a use case that you might have. So let's consider a case where you have an application and you want to put it into another system. Uh, maybe this will like ease you up into the idea of a container. So uh, if you normally have a, like a computer and that computer has some operating system, like let's let's limit ourselves to let's say Linux machines for now, but your work computer might have like a Ubuntu installation or your uh, department computer in your university. It might be like a Ubuntu operating system or something. And you, if you have an application on top of that, well, then 
that the application usually wants something from the um, from the operating system, or it it knows that okay, I'm I've been installed into Ubuntu operating system or something like that. It it might have been installed using the package manager. It might use the libraries from the operating system. Uh, if you now try to transfer this into another place, so in in our case, because we're dealing in the HPC world. Uh, it might be like a compute cluster that your university provides or your country provides or some, some other place provides. It might have, let's say, Red Hat-based operating system, so like a Red Hat or Alma Linux or whatever. And now when you, if you just try to transfer the application, like the application isn't necessary, isn't completely the same because like the operating system is different in the other system. So it's not the same program that you're running in the other system if you transfer it, like just move the program around. Yeah, because... and can I ask Simo, yes. so what what is it that's different? I mean, is the mm -hmm. application itself different or? Well, e even if the application is not different, so let's say you just copy the files around, you copy all of the files in the application, but the application might need something from the operating system. So for example, like many uh, applications might require or use this, they use this thing called libc, which is like the base, uh, like base operating system like libraries on how to, let's say, write files, how to open files and that sort of stuff and how to, how to calculate arithmetic and, and that sort of things. And that is different between operating systems, like certain operating system installation, like let's say you have Ubuntu 16.04, it has a completely different version of this libc than Ubuntu 22.04. So if your application needs the other one, it might, like like when you usually install an application, it, it often has like, okay, I have a different installation way for Ubuntu and different installation way for, let's say, Red Hat. Uh, so, so the application needs usually something from the operating system. Uh, like yeah. at the, even at the lowest level, it needs something from the operating mm. system. And I guess it, it might, I mean, if you just try to run the application that you run on your Ubuntu laptop, for example, on another HPC cluster, which is Red Hat, it might not even work at all. Mm. Yes, yes. And even if you work, even if it works, it might work by coincidence, you know, like mm. like some things might might work at a certain point in time, but let's say when they up when somebody upgrades their operating system, you know, like that happens all the time when you upgrade the operating system in your phone or when you upgrade the operating system, some applications just break, and and suddenly like what do you do? Like you, you cannot really go back in the upgrade, or you cannot. Like, do you ch suddenly start have to use really old operating system because you want to just have one application that that uh, you you need that old application uh, operating system for? So usually you don't want to do that, <laughs> and and this is why the containers come in and and why containers are so popular. So the idea behind the container, like when we talked about, it's containerized. Uh, it it has or everything with it. So what it does is that if you consider the picture, if you scroll a bit up, Enrico, yep. Um, the on the left side we have the home computer. Let's say your home computer. It has its own operating system. Then usually we have some container software, like when we in traditional containers that would be let's say Docker. Uh, that launches this container and that container has its own operating system inside of it, like a small Linux installation usually. And the application inside the container then would use everything from that, that world uh, in that everything inside that container to, to run. And if you would then move this container to another system, let's say the HPC cluster, and the HPC cluster would have the same so-called runtime, so container runtime or this container software that would uh, that can be used to launch the container. If that has the same tools, 
you can then run the exact same container with the exact same operating system and the um, exact same application because the containers are the same. So even though the host system uh, might be different, the guest system can be the same. So, so usually host refers to the machine that launches these containers and a guest is a machine like this container uh, that is basically like a guest operating system that comes there, it runs some application, and then it like goes away usually. Like when once the application closes, you shut down basically this operating system. So, yeah. so you. So, so I, you I guess that's the whole beauty of it all. I mean, the whole uh, host system can be different from that's the whole point of the case. The two different two host systems are different, but the container is just uh, dropped in on each of the host systems and run uh, equally on both. Yes. So this is what like like the big players in the in the like you if you think about your Azure or uh, Amazon web services or whatever like they provide places where you can run your containers. Of course they provide virtual machines as well but but usually or quite often they just provide place where you can run run your containers so you don't even necessarily know what is the host system you just know that it will run your application uh, and but but this is especially popular in the like traditional container world so traditional meaning uh docker podman kubernetes these kinds of words that you might have heard before uh that like they usually do a lot more than than just uh like when they launch these containers, they usually limit the resources, like limit the amount of processors the com like the container can use. They can create their own virtual network for these containers. Like they they do all kinds of like extra stuff, uh, like when they launch a container. But in in the case of an of an HPC situation, it's a bit different uh, because we don't usually need to worry about or we don't we cannot even necessarily do these kinds of operations because we don't we want to run them as ourselves uh, not as the uh, root user or the like the super user of the system because in a shared HPC system like a cluster you don't have privileges to run these like you don't have privileges to create your own networks and that sort of stuff so we have this kind of like a lightweight tool which is Aptainer um yeah. that we'll be talking about maybe simo one question you mentioned um virtual machines and somebody is also asking about virtual machines in the share notes what is the difference between virtual machines and containers yeah. so the virtual machines uh the difference is that the virtual machine like ver it creates like a virtual hardware that the machine will run on so so like the comp CPUs or whatever, they are like virtualized so that let's say, so there's like this kind of like a, the, like a, like a, how could I say it? Like a, there's this more uh, strict uh, difference between the host system and the, or, or the guest system and the, like the machine. So, so the, all of the resources, let's say memory and, um, and, and processors, they are, virtualized so so it will see basically that like a generic cpu or something inside the virtual machine but in a container what happens is that they still use the system resources they use like uh they use system cpu and that sort of mm -hmm. stuff they use the same resources so there's a technical uh explanation how containers work above but we won't go through that yeah. like because in this HPC situation, we cannot do this kind of more heavy virtualization because we cannot give people access to these kind of like root privileges. So yeah, yeah, you you mentioned this basically. You 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 exactly mentioned this that because HPC system a shared system, then instead of using technologies like Docker, we need to use something like Obtainer. But mm -hmm. here I'm gonna ask what is also written here. What is the intended use case of Obtainer? In, uh, in HPC context, yeah. So, 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 Aptainer is this kind of a technology that 
arouse uh, from originally i think it it mentioned Lo Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory was the original place where it was uh, created but it it was like a technology that's like a lightweight container so instead of doing the whole whole mess of setting up these kind of like root privilege situations it's intended to be used in a situation where like for scientific situations where you don't have extra access rights and you also want the uh, the container image that stores the data we'll talk about container images later uh, a lot more but the container image that contains the operating system and application you want that to be like st storable like easily storable uh, so that you can you can store your uh, application in a way that you can share it with other researchers like with the contain with the docker uh, technologies they, they have a way of transferring these kinds of like images around but it's not very like like ar archivable would i say like or like this it's not in in a sense of of like uh, or reproducible in a way that like scientific code needs to be reproducible like scientific code usually needs to be reproducible like years after the the original paper has been published so they wanted to create like a way of both storing the storing the containers in a way that you can then run them long after long afterwards mm -hmm. and also they wanted to way, make so that you can run it in whatever system like you can run it in these shared systems yeah and, and of course that that's not just uh, that's not just for Aptainer, but generally all container based technology it has the same um uh, idea or basis mm. for yeah yeah Aptainer is is just like it's been like how could i say it, like optimized for these kind of like scientific uh, scientific cases yes so, um, so yeah go right ahead yeah and also as you said you know uh, good to use for hpc where this kind of root uh, running as uh, yeah with the root privileges mm. is uh, more restricted so so for you cases where it's very useful is that if you have let's say you have a code well this can happen to anybody that you have a paper or a code that that somebody you want to replicate the results from a paper and the paper installation instructions are only given for a specific let's say ubuntu installation and the installation instructions use uh, let's say opt to install packages from the ubuntu uh, package manager manager so well, how do you do? How do you install this in in an ASPC system? Like either you need to figure out how do you get all of these requirements that the code needs uh, from the well software provided by the like the cluster admins usually, or you just create a container with an Ubuntu inside of it and then you just get it working. And that that can ease up many of these complicated installations. Uh, yeah, often. or or you just get the container which uh, that colleague or has already made ready for you with everything that's needed inside. Yes, yes, like it's, like it's very useful if you have a case where you know that okay, this will be used by multiple people. You can create like a self-contained container, self-contained application that you can then share with other people. And they can just run it, and and you can like even put it as a footnote or la, like a link in your paper, alongside your paper, so that you can then like say to people that okay, like you don't have to worry about the installation mess because it's uh, it's already there in the container. In many systems, also containers are used to reduce number of files needed, uh, like because like the container. What we're going to be talking about, the container image is only one file. And if you have like a, let's say, big Python installation, that can be thousands of files. So you might run out of like the number of files that you can install or you can have in your file system. So having it in the container can sometimes help with this. Yeah, it's good that you mentioned this because one of the questions in the shared document is, is uh, what do you mean by storing images using Aptainer? Is this a way around using volumes and mounts? It kind of relates to what you were saying of this uh, large amount of files and... Hmm. 
Yes. So we'll talk about like the volumes and mounts like are from the Docker world and in Abtainer world uh, there are different names, but uh, but basically the idea of of like how do you um yeah there's there there's more coming when we go to the let's not jump ahead the uh, to the image chapter uh but but we'll talk when we get to the container images we'll answer those exact questions well maybe actually we can move to the yes. to the next session yeah i'll i'll quickly note this this what enrico's highlighting here that uh there is this tool called singularity as well uh, which is basically Abtainer. So Abtainer is like Linux Foundation took over the open source project of, of Singularity, which is like a company project, but they are basically the same tool. So you can swap the, if your cluster has Singularity installed install, instead of Abtainer, just switch Singularity to Abtainer and Abtainer to Singularity and it will work the same. Uh, so it, yeah. it's the same tool. All right, but so I also added the question for everyone who is following on what is your potential use case of Abtainer or containers in general. So it's interesting to hear what people might think could be a good case for them. But then now going inside the basics of such technology, especially for HPC. So what are the different ways that you can run your container, Simo? Yes, so, so we'll cover throughout this session we'll cover these main cases that you want to use so so first one is that let's say you have a container that has some default application or like some application that the container has been built around it you can just run the container and what it does depends on the container that you're running uh, but but we'll, we'll look into that later second one is that you can run an interactive terminal you can go inside the container and run a, like an interactive session inside of it. And the third one is that you can just run an application uh, from within the container. There are other ways, like the services that we don't have probably time to go through. There's other ways of using the containers as well, but these are the main things you want to use. Quite often you have a case where, like if you have a ready-made container, you just run it. If you have a case where you want to go inside the container and see what's inside there, you take an interactive shell in inside the container. And quite often, if you have built your container yourself, you might just execute some program within that container. But we'll go through the, all of these uh, one by one. But uh, for these, like, because there's many of these like sub commands, uh, for Abtainer, uh, and it can become quite, well, it can become quite tricky to read the command lines. Uh, there's this kind of like syntax uh, highlighting, or how could I say it, like like a color highlighting that uh, I formulated for the material. Uh, if you have any kind of visual impairment and you don't see the highlighting, let us know because it would be nice to choose colors that are like as inclusive as possible, but these were just colors I chose. Uh, but basically, let's go first before we start going through all of these different ways of running the containers. Let's look at like what a typical uh, Abtainer command looks like. So, so usually at the like if you read the command from left to right, in this case we have like Abtainer sub command some image. Uh, dot sif, and then we have some additional commands. Uh, what we usually have is that at the left side, we have um, the Abtainer because we're using Abtainer. So that will always be there so so that you can basically like, you will, you will always run these with Abtainer. So just put Abtainer at the front. The second command is the important one for, for the Abtainer. So that tells what feature from Abtainer we want to use. Like this is a sub command. Uh, that will be, uh, we will uh, like look at different sub commands uh, in this session. Usually, uh, uh, after that, you have the image file. So we'll talk about the image files a bit later. But but usually, you have the image file that has the container that that defines the container basically. 
uh, you have that, and then that's highlighted in this purple. And after that, you might have some additional commands that are then executed within the container. So the app trainer doesn't care about them anymore, but they are usually like, um, like run inside the container. Um, and and why why this highlighting, like why we want I wanted to do this is that in many cases you can have different kinds of flags like this kind of like ar arguments uh, with these like dash dash or just dash arguments for many of the different commands. So so you might have arguments for the sub command and it can get really tricky to read uh, some of these commands if you don't have the if you haven't yet familiarized yourself with like how to read the commands. So for now, the important part is that like blue is the just the obtainer. This kind of orange yellow is is the sub command and the purple is the image. And you can just like keep those in mind when when looking at the looking at the commands that we'll be running. So for this session, let's try one uh, container. Let's try running uh, one container with the different methods that was mentioned before. So so let's run the container. Let's go inside the container and then execute a program inside of it. So Enrico, do you want to uh, run the commands while? Yeah, I was actually running the the commands while mm -hmm. while you were talking and. Uh... Okay problem is that they're still <laughs> they're still running so okay. meaning that something yeah. to to basically consider is that sometime building the yes the this actually so i'm i've been running in the background this obtainer pool okay. python.cif yeah. docker yeah maybe the it's... vpn is is uh, slow okay now it should be done so basically okay. i've i've run this uh, let me yeah. size a bit my screens so I've run the command obtainer hmm. pool Python shift and Docker. So yes. with what you mentioned earlier, it means that obtainer has pulled from Docker Hub an official Python image. We didn't specify here which version or anything, hmm. right? Yeah. And and then everything was turned into this Python dot yeah. We'll talk about the the way of pulling the images and these images more. So let let's let's focus first on. Like let's just say we have this zip file. Let's just start yep. start from there, and we'll talk about the ways we can create the different containers later. But all right, so then I type obtainer run Python dot zip. Yes. So yeah. so if we are running the container, like in this case, we are running some application that the uh, container creator has created as this kind of like default application. So. In this case, because we are we bro uh, broke, we got uh, the Python container uh, or Python container image from uh, Docker Hub, uh, we have like a like we can assume that yeah Python is probably the thing that's going to be running when it's running. So so this run command is basically when well if you would run a docker image you would have the similar kind of thing so we basically execute it as a like a execute like one executable and this is very powerful because then you can create like easily like an application out of your well your application like you can make your application installation into one file and then you can just run it and it will do what like it will just run an, like an application but of course you need to remember that like uh, you should trust uh, the application. Like if you run it, like you don't run. If you get an like a random email and you you get an executable, you don't usually run those. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same thing with containers that there are nefarious containers available and that sort of stuff. Uh, so always be mindful of what image are you running. Yeah. So, so and the whole point here when. When you are using the run command or action or sub command or what you want to call it, is that you're basically put right into the program that uh, is the default one. And here is Python. You just run the container and you go straight into Python. And of course, it mm -hmm. can be whatever else, depending on what's in the container. Yes. 
And it, like, if we look at the command here from the diagram, we just obtainer and the sub command run just executes basically the image. And if we launch you the container, and if you, well, let's look at it a bit later, but uh, basically what you're now doing is that you you start the container and you, you are now in this like virtual world. So let's um, let's continue. So this is basically how you how you run stuff. Uh, if but but of course it, it like this is the kind of a situation where it depends that the container needs to be like well prepared. Like somebody needs to like figure out okay what uh, what what the container should run. So so this is the kind of like a best case scenario where the container has been created well so that the running of the container is as easy as possible. There are cases where that is not the case, but <laughs> but in 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 best case scenarios, this is the kind of like uh, uh, container you can have. Yeah, and we'll we'll see just in a minute. Will you will be showing how to make this run scripts yes. as we call them uh, to yes. get this functionality. So, but let's say before we run the container, we might have, want to like look at what's inside of it, like like just to check what's inside of it. So. Enrico, if you want to run this obtain a shell command, and uh, let's go inside there. So, so what what we now get is we get an interactive terminal inside the container. So now we are. You notice that Enrico's like this uh, terminal prompt changed to this obtainer. So now Enrico's there, and can you type, uh, for example, like um, um, can you type, for example, echo dollar capital user? It's so let's, let's, yes. So you can notice that like in the container, because these are, we're using Aptain and we are this, this is this lightweight uh, container world. We are still ourselves inside the container. Like in, in this Docker world, you might become a root user when you're inside the container, but the obtainer, you're always yourself. Uh, you're always, uh, if you type host name, I wonder if the command is there, but. It's the same host where I am. Yes. So you notice that like Enrico is still at the same, same machine and Enrico, uh, still is, is himself. So, so it's just like running an application but now you're in this kind of like a container world where you're running uh well you're it's, it's a bit different world but uh and there's different things there can you run the uh, command dash v python uh, uh like python version uh like no but i mean like to check which python we have uh, um, where does the Python come from, or which Python? Uh, but, but I'm not certain if which is installed there. Yeah. Uh, There's no which. <laughs> yeah. Can you type command dash v Python? So we notice that the Python interpreter here, like in this image, it's been installed into user local bin Python, like. It's up to them to decide the container creators, like where to have the installed Python. But but this is like you can see that this might not be the place where Python is outside of the container. So should we go out and 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 then continue on? So so this is where you can like go inside the container with the shell, and you can check around what's what's inside there, and you can uh, you can look well. You can get accustomed to. What what is the container that you're currently using? Especially useful if you don't know what what's inside the container, like if if you got it from the internet. Uh, let's then check like how do you run one application or some single program from a container? So if the run script, let's say the run script doesn't contain what you want, or you just want to run something else, but you want to run it inside the container, inside the guest like operating system, and inside the uh, container world uh, inside the image, we can uh, use this exec to execute it. And this takes as an added uh, added um, like arguments, whatever command you want to run. So you can read it as like obtainer 
then the exec subcommand, and then the image name, and then after the image name, whatever is there, you can uh, check that. Okay, this is the uh, like this is what we want to run. So so when you visualize, okay, like oh, where <laughs> how should I read this command after the image file? Like after everything after that, you would like you can just basically like take the front side of that command and then then like ignore it and the rest of will be executed inside the container. So if you now run this command, so this this container, this Python container is built upon Debian. So it's not the Ubuntu container, it's built on this Debian operating system. So we can check what is the Debian version. It's Debian version 12, for example. And we because Enrico is not running Debian over here in the host system, we can definitely see that. Like if you, yeah, if you want to try it. Yeah, now I'm running it. No, I'm not inside the container. I'm in this whatever node of the cluster and it's saying no such file of directory. Yes. Generally, because it's not Debian. <laughs> yeah. Yes. This so is interesting. At least when I started using this, this type of technology, I always felt that when I type something like, like this, it's like I'm SSAging to, you mm. know, a, re a remote machine called python.sif. And then suddenly, you know, what I see here is different than what I see in the... Mm. Yeah, that's a completely like, uh, like you are basically doing that sort of thing, but you are SSAging basically to the same machine, but in yeah. a different world, like a, like a strange uh, dimension or something like that. Okay. But this is like, it's not very complicated, like I would say. Like the most complicated thing about App Trainer and, and Docker as well, I would say, are the command lines. <laughs> like like the most complicated things, well, well, the concepts might be complicated, but the comp concepts are often clouded or like hidden behind the command lines because the command lines can get very long. So, but, but you shouldn't let that uh, like dissuade you from, from using them. It's just about okay, figuring out what blocks you put there. And, and we and, have to remind you, of course, to use yeah. the app tainer help. You can maybe write that on the command line now, Enrico. Yes. That will give you, of course, the you know the the manual of how to yes. use this. Yes, and there's there's plenty of these commands, other commands. There's like a good reference guide from app tainer's page as well. But there's there's huge amounts of these, and you can get help for each subcommand separately. So if you don't, if you forget, like okay, what were the flags for one command or or another, you can always run obtainer help. Uh, uh, other way around. Yeah, the and then you'll see the syntax typically also. So we use the subcommand help uh, to check, like for example, what is the. Um, syntax for that there's a lot yeah. of text there so and some examples and yeah so yes. that that should be on your fingertips all the time <laughs> yes so okay so now that we get like a grasp of okay it's not so complicated to run hopefully uh, it's not so complicated to run a container we can go a bit back and think about the container images so what what is this SIF file that we suddenly got, and what is what is container image? What are we talking about? And first, let's let's look at the terminology again a bit, because that helps us understand the thing. Uh, so let's first focus on tra how traditional Docker container images work, like Docker, and uh, the name comes from well, the image comes from like actual images, <laughs> like like if you think about an image. So Enrico, if you want to scroll a bit down to show the picture. So here's like an unfinished painting by Leonardo da Vinci. And, and the image here has multiple layers. You can see them because it's unfinished. So you can see that there's like, like some areas that are completely white and you should see the background panel, like this was like oil on panel or something like that. Uh, so you can see the background panel, like for example, the hand of the character or the uh, the lion. Uh, you can see that there's like white, white or almost white space there, and that is like the background. And on top of that, sometimes there's sketches on front of it. There's been something drawn on top of it, 
And sometimes there's something painted on top of it, like for example, the background. And sometimes there's like sketches made on top, on front of the the background uh, painting. Like, so you have basically like a panel, then you might have a sketch, you might have a paint on top of that sketch, and you might have a sketch on top of that paint. So you have layers. So you have multiple layers on in this image, and and you can you can see them here because it's it's not yet like a full image because it's unfinished. And this is how traditional containers work as well. Like they they take the idea of an image built from layers. So you basically like you take something and then you make a, you paint something over it. And then you make another layer paint on top of it. And when you, and what are these layers? Um, if you scroll a bit uh, below, there's another uh, like a diagram. Uh, well, this is a bit uh, smaller. So maybe if you do want to take it full screen or, or maybe. So, so what you can, what you have in these containers is that, like, you have something uh, of a base layer. In this case, in in the case of these containers, it might be an operating system, and and then when you do any modifications on that, you paint basically another layer on top of that base image. Like it's often called base image. This, uh, let's say, you have like a Ubuntu installation or something. And that's your base image. So that would be the panel in the painting, basically. And then you paint, let, let's say you modify a file or you install an application on top of it. You basically paint on top of this previous image. So you paint on this panel and you you do some modifications. And what these traditional container technology do is that they like record the differences, what happened. Like when you have the base image and then you do some modification, so you basically paint something on top of the base image, uh, it records what was painted and then it stores that as a separate layer. So if you are familiar with Photoshop or GIMP or other of these like, uh, like photograph, like image editing tools, they often also work in layers. So you might have multiple layers of images on top of images. And and each layer hides something from the uh, hides something from the below layer, or it might not hide. So, for example, in the in the Leonardo's painting, like the hand wasn't painted, so there's nothing hiding. There's nothing painted on top of that area, but some other areas might be uh, painted over. So, let's say you take an like a base image of an Ubuntu installation, and you upgrade all of the software inside of there you now modify multiple files. So you basically create a new layer of the upgrades. And what the traditional container world does is that it records these layers. And why, why it does that is that it makes it easy to do, easy to store a lot of software. Because let, let's say, think about like, let's say Docker Hub, which is this kind of like registry of, of images in the internet. They only have to store a few instances of, let's say, Ubuntu operating system. And then whenever somebody wants to use Ubuntu operating system, they don't have to like store another copy of the Ubuntu operating system. They just copy the, like, they take that base image and then they take whatever differences the, the other image does. So, so basically they like, uh, riff on this previous image, they create another version of that. And how the images are built uh, is that they are done in this kind of way where each command that you run in these kind of Docker files that define how to create the image, they paint another layer. And at the end, you take all of the layers and you call that an image. So basically, you say that, OK, this is my, my image now, but it's still stored in these layers. It's stored in these kinds of like individual differences of uh, operations, and of course, if you modify like a layer, like if you want, if you create this one image and then you let's say choose a different base image, you need to do all of the differences again. 
but but then it's like a different image. But what they do is that basically they they store all of these differences uh, and and the image is stored in these so-called squasafas layers. So it's like this kind of like file systems in a file kind of a way. And in the diagram, we see like an ex example where we have like a container image that might be like a base image. And then on top of that, you might have like an application and another application. And they might like hide something from the layer before, or they might like, um, they might like not hide something. So, so you might have like, uh, um, yeah, you might have a situation where where you have like something new added by the uh, next layer. So, uh, so this is how traditional containers work. But of course, like because in in traditional containers, like this this makes it easy to transfer the let's say the same image across multiple like uh, cloud infrastructures or something like that because you just need to transfer the layers. You save on storage space and you save on the network network space but it doesn't make it very easy to to make it like static or make it reproducible because like i mentioned if you change something from the base image suddenly everything changes like you need to rebuild the whole thing and and what that's what they often do they rebuild the whole thing <laughs> they rebuild the images automatically and and it, like stuff changes often and it's not very good for scientific code where you might want to run the exact same code. Yes, uh, yes, like in many years, like you might want to have a situation where you want to run the exact same thing. So Aptainer has a bit of a different approach, but they, they still use these. Like you can still create Aptainer images from these Docker images. And what Aptainer basically does is that when you have an image, like whatever image, let's say a Docker image, it's basically like you take a print of a painting. Like instead of having the individual layers there, you let's say you take a photo out of it or scan the image, and then you print it. Like if you if you got it from a printer, it's it's just one paper with ink on certain spots, and it's there's no layers there like from in a print, printed like paper. So it's it's the same so it's it's like one one just one layer where everything is squashed together so so it it takes all of like let's say when you create like a image out of a docker image what you do is that you or what aptainer does is that it takes all of the layers and then it basically like squashes them together so it leaves what what you would see like it will leave the image that you would see the just the top layers uh yeah, like, and I guess then you cannot go back and modify one layer in the middle, basically. Yes. That's the whole point. Yes, because that's like, been that you could like, do for Docker. Yes, yes, and and that's and that's like the the idea behind it. Because and then all of that is stored in one file, which is this CIF format, which is this uh, singularity image format. That is basically like that is the squasafas layer plus some metadata. For example, the the original file that was used to create the uh, like the container, it contains some metadata that it explains, okay, what version of Aptainer was used to create this image, what version of what what how how did how was this created and and like what and then the actual data or what's there. Um, this yeah. has some upsides, so it's it's much more portable. So you can easily like transfer it using normal tools. You don't have to use these registries. Like the traditional containers are transferred using these container registries, or sometimes the layers are stored into these cardboards. But but quite often, like in the transferring of traditional containers is quite tricky. But and so these are much more portable. Like you can just use like SCP or RSync or just copy it from place to place and it's very easy to transfer them. Uh, and and because they're static, they're very reproducible. Uh, and and they're very easy to archive. The downside is that like because of the squashing process, it, it takes a bit more time to create them. And if you need to do like it again, you need to do the squashing again basically. You need to like look look at you need to take the layers again and do the squashing. So building the images can sometimes take a bit more time 
and also you cannot store them into these traditional registries like Docker Hub. Uh, they used to be this thing called Singularity Hub, uh, but but it's now defunct uh, for storing these Singularity images. But but most of the time you just like I don't know put them to Zenodo or something like or or GitHub or whatever and and. Mm. Just... And and there's a lot of mention of Docker uh, here, so yeah. maybe that's confusing for the listeners. But why why is Docker so why is Docker used everywhere when we're talking about Aptainer? Yes, could you say so, something? So, yeah, so so the doc, Docker is like like when you when you Google container, when, Docker is the the tool that you run up. It it's up to the point where like. Docker file is like the how to how do you write these images is called a Docker file, but nowadays it's often systems that are not running Docker like containers are run without Docker even, but they were basically so popular that it became like a so it's like a like in the US you might have a like Kleenex or something like like yeah. like for for like a tissue. Like you might, the brand name is so popular that is nowadays referring to like whole industry. So even though Docker is nowadays, like you might have Kubernetes or something, which is very powerful on running containers or Docker Compose, where these are like the traditional tools. And Docker is the company that made these. And it was so popular that lots of the terminology is, is still left. And if you I Google containers, you will first come to Docker and, and that's a different kind of a technology and that's more like heavyweight compared to Aptainer. Mm. And also it's good uh, because uh, it makes like a standard that uh, is, uh, you know, uh, easier to use because yes, there's and not also, so many different starting points. Yes, and also there's existing infrastructure there. So for example, the image that Enrico pulled out the Python image that was provided by Docker Hub, well, the Docker company itself, like, and they had their, like many software developers, they provide software through Docker Hub or uh, like Google. there's other registries like Quayo or uh, GitHub container registry. There's like many places where people might provide these container images through, um, you, you might have heard like a year ago or two years ago there was a big uproar in the open source community when docker hub uh, planned on making open source projects like like pay money for storing stuff in docker hub but they they went back on that uh quite quickly uh because the open source community uses docker hub very commonly to share various applications through there. So there's already lots of applications or lots of base images that you can use to start up your own images. So for example, you don't need to like start installing like, I don't know, like like CUDA toolkit uh, or some really complicated thing into an image because there's probably an image for that already provided by either the software developers themselves or the underlying like technology creators. So there's plenty of like existing applications uh, <clears throat> available there. Excellent. So I think we covered everything when it comes to this page related to this obtainer versus Docker. I wanna raise one question from the share document and please keep on adding your comments or questions there. So are obtainer containers lightweight or are obtainer containers normal and Docker containers heavyweight? So yeah. It, yeah. could you think it like this in, in, in an intuitive yeah, way? In a sense, like 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 basically like, like Docker containers are like, um, let's say you uh, like, like Docker containers are much more like they have a more strict list or they have a much more like options available to them, but they, but you need to be usually the super user to run them. So you can do like, you can run like bigger services or run multiple containers at one time that discuss with each other in a virtual network or something like that. You can create like this kind of like more complex applications uh, usually with those and they have like more capabilities and they are so in that sense, more heavyweight, but the heavyweight also means that you 
you need to have certain things to be able to run them and when you run them you then you need to like usually like figure out okay what why is everything off by the root user or something like that there's that like you have a lot more capabilities but there's also a lot more overhead uh when creating those it's a great technology and and if you're interested in in like web services and whatever like it's good idea to familiarize with yourself with that but the focus here is more on this like okay if i take the best or, or that part in the it's like the container technology that makes it really easy to to do hpc stuff or really easy to, to do scientific software deployments scientific software installations if i just take that piece and i try to make a product or like a container around that thing what can I achieve? And that's basically what Aptain and, and Singularity try to do is that they take that one part in, in the container technology that is very useful in scientific context and just that part. Because then you don't have to worry about the like the overhead. You don't have to worry about uh, like root rights or whatever. You don't have to worry about a lot of stuff. And you can just focus on uh, the, well, the app of the <laughs> app running the application instead of uh, like w w what network drivers should I use or something like that. Great. It's exactly 11 o'clock in Finland, 10 o'clock in Central Europe. So I guess we could have a 10 minutes break. The stream will be back in uh, 10 minutes. You can keep on adding questions or comments to the share notes and uh, see you in 10 minutes. Bye. Hello and welcome back. So we have covered quite a lot of the basics of containers in general and specifically about Aptainer and why is it useful in HPC. I think it's now time to build some Aptainer images, right? Yes. See my mic and... Absolutely. Yes. Before we go there, let's. Uh, I want to address a few questions in the HackMD, which were really good. Uh, that were, were about the uh, overhead of running these containers. Uh, so, does it require extra memory requirement? Do you need like anything to that to take into uh, to into account? And basically, no. <laughs> like, uh, what what? How these work? Like, I don't go into technical details, but they use this tool called like uh, namespaces in the Linux kernel. So what it basically does is that it swaps the, like in the container, it basically swaps the, uh, like the operating system with these classes with the kernel. Like it just swaps that around so that it now uses stuff from the operating, like instead of taking libraries from the operating system, it gets it from the image, but it's basically like transparent. So there's like few megabytes maybe the overhead, overhead and it, it it doesn't slow down the computing at all like it's completely like same the speed uh so so even though we are talking about the guest operating system and that sort of stuff it doesn't mean that it like starts up like uh like gnome desktop or something like that it it doesn't do any it it doesn't start this kind of like services it just like swaps out the file system from underneath the application and then it like Runs with that same files, a different file system, so it's it's basically doesn't use any any extra resources. There's technical reasons you can look at the first ses section. There's like a extra point about this, but but I don't want to go to that because that's that's more in the Docker world, and we try to keep it in the app in the world throughout this session. All right, so. Yes. so building up tenor images yeah so so previously we we just bypassed one of these uh, commands that enrico was running which was this pooling an image so what 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 do we mean when we pull an image so, so this is again part of the docker world so what we do is that we if we have a registry like a container registry uh for example docker hub which is very popular and it has some images. And usually these images, uh, you can pull them, like if they are open, uh, you can just like, uh, you can 
uh, like basically download the layers and then you create a container out of those layers uh, and uh, what and the pool basically means okay just download these layers for me and create me an image out of it like this CIF image out of it uh, like um, we can use like if you go to a docker hub and you see like a url like a command that what like what they say how to pull the image so so for example they say docker pull python so over there uh so what you in in the singularity or up in a world you just need to put this docker colon slash slash on front of that that last part uh to 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 get the to to tell the obtainer that okay you you're now get, trying to pull from a docker image uh there's other kinds of registries you can check the help help page for pull sorry uh but the but but, but basically what it does is that it will like it will ask the docker hub to okay what what is this what the, what are you what do you mean when you when I ask for Python, and it will like it will get you the the correct uh, tag, and there's this specification for this. So the full full path or full name of the registry would be Docker IO, uh, and then there would be a, like a library of Python and latest. So this this is important if you're pulling from another registry. You need to you might need to give it as a like a different registry path. But in this case, like let's just go with the first first command and let's uh, check on on this. So so the most important part is that if you have like a registry that has container images, you can just pull them. So let's try it out. So you have a pull image, and then you have the image name, and then where do you want to pull it from? So now I already have it here. I'm gonna delete it. This Python sif. So that I will build it again. Of course, now I've already run this common one, so there might be some caching, isn't it? Mm. Yes. But you're basically saying like obtainer, use subcommand pool, use image python.sif, and then from Docker get me Python. So use this Docker registries and this Docker and yeah, it it is well, the you have yeah. <laughs> if if you wouldn't have the caches, it would download various layers and then it would merge them into the CIF image. And if you now type ls, you probably have the Python CIF there as again. Yeah. Yes. Even though I deleted it. Yeah. So. Well, maybe uh, what if if I change the cache, which yes. is the next. Yes. So, so so. Yeah. So so because the creation of the image like if you think about again like we need to get all of the different layers of the painting in order to create like the image that we can then print out basically <laughs> we can take the print out of that into the sif file uh it needs to download all of the layers like the obtainer needs to download all the layers and by default it goes to your home folder so this is kind of something that can easily fill up your home folder if you're in a cluster where your home folder has some small quota or something so it's usually a good idea to move this cache directory to somewhere else so for example if enrico now i did actually already move my cache okay. folder so this is for example where i have it okay in this system so it's not in my home yeah so do you want to move it to to the like current folder yeah. that you have yeah let's make a subfolder like we have in the materials yeah update and underscore cache and then i export this variable up no without, uh, without the dollar yeah. yeah cash dear equal wherever i am slash obtainer cash let's see if i did any yes. typo and now if i have a look again at this variable now the path is this new path yeah the pwd right is is the current folder in in a Linux terminal, so basically current folder, obtaining cache. So now if you do the pull command uh, again, if you remove the previous image, so let's get rid of the previous image and now arrow up until I find the command, and I press enter. Yeah. So now now you see that 
Enrico has to download all of the different layers. And you can see these blobs. <laughs> so nice word for these <laughs> layers, but basically they are stored in these blobs and then they they are unpacked and converted. And some of the operations might be that they cannot be done for various reasons as, because we are not running as a root user, but it doesn't usually matter. Uh, like usually it's easy to convert them and unpack them into these layers. So this will take a while, so we can probably uh, look at the next uh, situation already while this is running. So this is how you get like a ready-made container. Like if you if somebody has created your container and you just want to pull it out, that's usually well often the case. But sometimes it's not, and you need to create your own container, or you want to create your own container. So if you want to create your own container. Do you mean that we should kind of write the, how can I call it, the recipe for the container? Mm -hmm. Yes. I I previously mentioned uh, that, that Docker uses these things called Docker files. And Aptane doesn't use those. Uh, Aptane uses something called definition file. And it's like an Aptane specific way of writing, um, like, like, like Enrico said, the recipe for the container. Um, and but but and but the, the important thing to remember is that you can use an existing, let's say, a Docker container as the starting point, and then just like 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 spice it up <laughs> the recipe. So, yeah, uh, in this uh, example, let's look at this. Like we have this small Python snippet. Like let's say we want to make an application around this Python code that we have here. So this is like a small Python code that just sums up numbers that you give it like a like this could be whatever like you like in your mind put your application here basically like your application your code could be here and uh if we want to put this into a container uh we might do it in in the way that the definition file has been written over there in the documentation so in the definition file if we look at that in detail we have, uh, the, at the first line, we have this bootstrap colon docker. So that means basically the same thing as we had previously, like the docker colon slash slash kind of thing. So we, we want to take stuff from Docker registry. So let's bootstrap the image, like take the first starting point and use Docker to do it. You can use other ways. You can use previous singularity images as well uh, to do the bootstrapping. Like you can use a previously existing image but uh, let's say in this case, we want to use Docker and then we have a from statement there. So this defines, okay, what is the image we want to use? And in this case, it would be uh, the latest Python image. So the one that Enrico is now pulling. And then we have two different, these blocks and these blocks are uh, shown by these uh, percent signs. Uh, so, so the first block here is files, and this block basically means that okay, copy these files into the container. So in this case, we have on the left side we have a summation.py, so that would be this summation uh, summation.py script, and we have a, a, after that slash opt. So it basically says that copy this file to opt, and uh, and then we have another block called run script, which basically defines uh, the run functionality. Like when we obtain a run this image, what happens? We define this run script block. And this is basically like, just like a shell script, like a bash script that you define there. And over there we define like, uh, like we, we print out what arguments we get and then we execute with Python the, the summation. Uh, and I wanted to put this kind of an example here because sometimes the argument handling can be a bit tricky. Like, or, or like, like if you are not familiar with Bash, uh, it, like giving your arguments to whatever program you want to run there can be tricky. So you can just copy paste this kind of stuff. So in in of, often when you're running or creating an application, you just want to pass whatever like extra arguments straight up to the application that you're running. You don't want to like 
do any modifications to them or something like that. You just yeah, want to pass and, them around. And... and that could typically be, for example, the data you want to run on. Yes. This is a very good example. Maybe you have your data on your host machine and you want to just add that as an argument to the application that you're running. Yes, and, and sometimes also, like, let's say you have a container that contains the dependencies of your code, let's say, like a Python code, but you still modify your code. You want to modify the script that the, that is running in the container. So maybe you want to pass the, the name of the script there as well. So, but we'll talk about how do you get like stuff from outside the container into the container in the next session. Uh, but but for now, let's just think that okay, that can be whatever like whatever that you would want to have in your uh, like you would want to pass to your program. So let's try creating this and and yeah, in practice, I already did a game for yes. timing reasons. Yes, but I've run this common obtainer build my container, blah, blah, using this same definition file yes. that is written here. Yes. And if you look at the uh, the picture here, the like, again, it's like obtainer, that's always there. Then we subcommand build, that is how we built the containers. And then we name the definite, uh, the, we first name the image file that we want to create. And then we create a definition file or say the definition file. You can also have this, like, like we we don't have time to cover this, but you can have these build arguments as well. So if you want to, like, I don't know, like create multiple versions of the same software with, like, I don't know, like with different versions installed, you can have these arguments into this build process that are then like, like gone through in the definition file. But we don't have time to go to that. But there's plenty of like advanced stuff you can do in this build process as well. But okay, now that we have, let's say, like, dream that we have run this command. Yeah. Uh, and if we now obtain a run the container, see if what happens. One and two. Yes. So it did so, the same. Yeah, if we look at the run script again uh, quickly. Uh, so in the run script, we have. First is echo, got arguments, and then there's like this dollar asterisk that says, okay, print the arguments basically. And then we we give the arguments forward to the uh, Python summation. So, yeah. Okay, so this uh, is how you Can I just it. mention yeah. one thing also? So as you, as you see, if you scroll up to the run script again, Enrico, the whole point here is this this can be however long, obviously. So you could be running uh, one executable and you could be doing something and you could be doing another executable afterwards and so on. So yeah, this is an example mm. showing two, but here there can yes. be one or many. Yes. And but but you have, this run script, what's important to notice is that this is executed when the pro, like the container is run. Uh, so this is not done during the build step. So, so this is only when the container is run. Of course, this is stored in the container, but but this is like run over there. But let's say you want, like, like you most likely want to do some modifications to the container uh, while you're building it. So you want to install, let's say, some stuff that is more. You won't only want to run it during the build step. You don't want to run it every time when the container runs. So for that, we'll need to look at another section in the in the definition file, and and this is the next thing we have over here, which it is post step. So for the post here, post means here uh, that it's a post post building or post bootstrapping. So so it's after the bootstrapping has been done. So after the image has been created, uh, the layers have been squashed what extra stuff is being run. And and here, for example, we can have like pip install numpy here. So to install numpy into the container, like it's an arbitra arbitrary thing over here that we have added, but it's it's like one thing. Uh, what is important to note is this post step is that in the container, when we are building it, we are running in a mode called fake root. Uh, so, so what it means that you appear as a root user when you're running there, even though you're not a root user. 
So this is like a, it uses these guest namespaces, and it's it's like a pretty complicated complicated thing uh, what it does. But but basically, if you have installation instructions that normally have like sudo up up the install or whatever this kind of like stuff, you usually need to take the sudos out because you are already like a super user and like you are a super user like in this imaginary world you are the god basically when you're running this and and you can do all kinds of modifications to the image so if you have installation instructions that have sudo in them you usually need to modify them to take the sudos out uh, and of course when you're creating these post steps be mindful that don't put anything into the container that you don't want to like have it in the container because once the container has been written out, anybody can read it. So, so like, uh, don't put your passwords inside there or something like that in the post step. So Enrico is uh, running yeah, it, in, I think. In the background, basically. So I expanded the original uh, recipe definition file. I added this block post pip install numpy. And now here I'm rebuilding. I, I gave it a new name. So now it's it's basically here. You can see creating a new image mm -hmm. with uh, with the NumPy. So when this will be done, I would be able to run this uh, obtainer exec, which means run the common Python minus C import NumPy and print. Mm -hmm. And the expected, the expected output would be something like this that it would say, yes. I don't know now if today, NumPy went up into one version, yes. but uh, but basically this is what we will yes. get. But but again, like in your, you can imagine that that can be whatever. Like that can be install or run run complicated installation things. Of course, like one uh, uh, like one annoying thing sometimes can be that if you have a very complicated installation procedure, this post step is done in one block. So so basically, you might have a situation where uh like like your installation fails like you forgot to do something and then it like took a while, long time to do there are possibility of do, doing these multi stage builds where you basically build one container and then you build one container and then you can like make it so that you can spread spread out the installation commands but but we won't be focusing that, on that today uh but but yeah you this this can sometimes happen so if you have this kind of a situation where you have like really complicated installation in the post step uh you might want to check on that it's nice to uh, see so now in the background that now it, it ran the pip install numpy yeah and so now i see the like the output that i would see if i would type that command and yes. now it's the last stage creating this squash squash fs c file so yeah. in, in theory, Simo, like I know that many, many users of clusters are using Conda environments. So in theory, one person could encapsulate a whole Conda environment in this way. Then instead of having pip install numpy, I could have something like mm. Conda create, blah, blah, blah. Yes, yes. And uh, there will be, hopefully I'll, I'll finish the exercise uh, creation uh, after after this session, but there's uh, already existing like a bootstrap definition wrapper that that is already in the tips and tricks session, uh, but there will be exercise about this. Uh, but yeah, you can you can put like a like full environment or whatever inside of the container. That's that's very useful, especially in places where you run out of the file spaces or you have a huge amounts of files. And then because this installation kind of creates everything inside the container, it will be that basically I could then just move this sieve file that has all the container that is sorry that are all the conda environment that I need to another system and it would work, isn't it? Mm. There is uh there is some questions already uh, ready in the chat about um uh, okay how can I add extra stuff on the container. So we'll talk about binding stuff into the containers later or uh, a bit later. Uh, so you can like put stuff in there. But another way is, of course, using an existing container and bootstrap on top of that. So you can all, like you can choose to use obtainer as a bootstrapping method and use an existing container and bootstrap on top of that, and then just use that one. That's one way of doing it. 
but there there are possible ways what is the best way it depends on your application but we can discuss this um well after the binding session and also uh, at the end but it's a it's a great question so other modification that is very common uh, is that like like almost always you want to do something like this in this um, this example is to modify the environment where you're running. So let's say your application needs some environment variables that it always needs, but but the user forget like you don't necessarily uh, always want to set like you manually yourself. One example is the language things. So in the container, uh, well, like this happens to me all the time because I mainly use, well, I often have like Finnish keyboard settings and stuff like that, maybe in my terminal. And then the, when you go into the container, the container is like, okay, I don't understand anything about Finnish. Like it's, it's like, like I have never heard about this kind of a language because like the container doesn't necessarily contain the localization packages needed for this. So often in the applications, you need to tell via these environment variables that, hey, just use whatever language. Like I don't care. <laughs> just use the like the C language is this kind of like a minimum language that you can have so like in this case for example you can have in the environment these variables set so that okay like just have these uh set, set these environment variables when the container run these can be of course much more complicated environment variables like if your application needs certain things but but the like if you have this kind of a set, case or a reason to set the environment variables you can set them here the important, like some of you might be asking, okay, I have these environment variables. Why didn't I set them in the run script? So this is because uh, the run script only applies for the run function. Like there's multiple ways we can go into the container. We can take the shell route. We can take the interactive session. We can take the exec route and we can take the run route, but only the run script, run script is only executed when we run the container. So let's say these language settings, they might be also helpful when we we take a shell there. So this is like a broader concept. And these will be always executed when the these commands here, when the container is launched, whatever way it's launched. So uh, again, I will say that trust, like check, like who, who has created the containers you have done, because of course it could be whatever here, like it could be, RMRF, like something like like it could be something nefarious there. So so don't run applications you don't trust the creator of. So so be mindful of that because like um yeah check 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 beforehand <laughs> uh who who has created the application you have done. Uh but but yeah in the environment step here is quite often you you see stuff like this in the container. You can also during the runtime, you can also set these set the environment variables in the container by uh, giving these extra flags or setting these extra environment variables. You can also prepend some, let's say, path variables and that sort of things. But that's yeah, again, more complicated than for specific use cases. Would yeah, this... um, sorry. Okay. You, you first, Mike. Okay, yeah. So these are two different ways of doing it. One is just typing it on the terminal when you're running your obtainer command. Mm. Uh, then you can pass these arguments, and that's handy. But of course, I mean, uh, rather than typing a long, long uh, command, it might be convenient just to add it in the, in the definition file. So that's just yes. the basic difference. Yes. One comment that I had related to HPC, would this be a good way to pass, for example, the ID of an array job with this minus minus env if I have to pass it to the container or or any other learn variables that I have in the current environment? Is is this a mm -hmm. way to do it? Uh yeah, yeah. That that's yeah, if you if you want to pass something something to the uh because like it sometimes the Let's say the the, the container might override some environment variables that you have in the host system, 
so if you want to make certain that certain environment variables are set in the container, you you can do it via these like these kinds of tags. Yeah. So, but one one important thing is about like uh, about this ten images is is like you can add a, additional functionality that like let's say that will help help you and other users use the containers. So, so you can add documentation to the image itself. And and how this work is that you can you can set these for example these labels uh, block with adds additional like metadata labels that you can then check. Uh, in the container, and and you can also add these help blocks so that people can check how to use the run function. So of course it's a good idea probably to have some like dash dash help interface or something like that for the help function it's or the run script itself. But if you don't have that, it's it's also a good idea to uh, add this help block. So once you have created these help blocks you can then use obtainer inspect and obtainer uh, run help to to view these uh view these blocks so you can you can check these uh so if you run this run help it will show you the help for the running for the run script and if you run the inspect it will show you the the labels uh, like I'm showing now in this expected yes. results, you can also like um, like see the definition file because, like I mentioned, uh, in the image itself, the definition file is stored in the C format, so it's a bit more complicated. The commands, but but they are below, and they will produce. Uh, you can you can view the uh, the C format itself and you can dump the uh the definition file out of it so if you want to run the uh obtain a sif dump thing uh just a yeah. i forgot to put an expected result there so so what that what it does is that it it dumps out the first block uh in the sif file which is the definition file uh, Sif. Yeah. So that's the definition file used to create it. So basically, you can check what definition file was used to create the image. You can also like, if you want to share your applications, you can also like cryptographically sign the container so that the container has like a key, uh, and it it's signed using that key so that you can verify that. The containers are, but but that's like for most users not necessary, <laughs> I would say. But but if you want, you can do that. You can do all kinds of fancy stuff with the container. There's lots of functionality in the tool. Uh, but for ma many cases, like the most important thing is that uh, you want to like uh, you want to uh, pull already existing images. You want to build on top of these images you want to build uh, run an extra like post step on there you might want to change some environment variables you want to create your own run script you want to create your own documentation um that is what what more often you want to do when you build these images there's other features mentioned here that you can do with obtain but we don't have, unfortunately have time to go through all of these and exactly, we have a little bit less than 20 minutes left together. Mm. Should we have a look at some, something that you mentioned earlier, that what if I need to access from the container files that are outside of the container, mm. like loading some data or? Yes. Yes, so 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 like the containers are fine, fine and all, but usually you have a situation where you want the application to be containerized, but then you want to use that application for something. Right, yeah, and and that something is usually some data, or or it might be like you want to have a container that con like what when we were talking about, okay, how can I extend the container to have my application? Like if you let's say you have a code that you're writing, uh, which is like I don't know like Python code or other code, which is interpret code, 
interpreted. Uh, so you use some interpreter to run the code. Uh, it, you might want to put the dependencies of your code, like the Python interpreter, all of the dependencies, and that sort of stuff into a container. But then you can have the script itself outside of the container so that you can develop it. Like that's one way of working with the container. But if you have it outside of the container, how do you get it inside there? Like that's like, like you didn't, if you don't add it in the post step or in the file step in the definition file, how do you even get it there? And, and this brings us to the bind mounts um, a tool or a way of working that the, uh, the containers do. So, so what, what are bind mounts? They're basically like, you have a file system inside the container. Like you have an operating system there, you have a file system and you have like folders like slash home or whatever, uh, or scratch or like in the, in the host system, you have some folders and in the file system of the container, there's some folders and these are different folders, right? Like these are different folders in different places. Uh, but what you can do is that you can like create like a wormhole uh, from one reality to another reality. So you can bind something from outside the container, from the host system into the container to some location. And AppTainer does this automatically for certain folders already. So if you look at the diagram here, uh, by default, home folder is, is bound to the image. So your home folder is, is the same. So, for example, your bash RC or whatever is, is the same, and uh, your well, like stuff in your home folder is the same, because lots of time people have stuff in their home folders when they execute, so it's very easy to run the same application. Uh, and then the current directory is also always bound to the image. So when you go inside the image, you are in the same folder, uh, you, and that that file folder is found there. And also the temp directory slash temp uh, is is bound to the image, but and and there's a few others like run and whatever, but but like they are more like technical. Nobody uses them really, but uh, uh, but then there there might be some other folders that are not like in the image. So for example, if you think about your operating system, your the host system that you're running on. You have the root file system, so, so the slash, just like the slash uh, file system. And you might have slash user and slash opt where the usually the software is installed. Those are different. So they are in different colors here in this diagram. In the container, that, that's basically the point of the container, right? You, you need to have the root file system different than the host file system. Uh, so, so the applications are different there. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah, this the, the, these are different by design. But then you might have some a additional folders like slash m or slash scratch or slash l or whatever, like the local, like the network drive systems or other local file systems or something like that. Other folders that are uh, that you use for storing data, you use, use storing stuff. And those are not mounted by default. Like you don't have them available in the container by default. So, uh, so what you can do is that you can then bind those folders into the container so that they appear there in the container. Yeah, uh, and and this could typically be, as you said, you know, where you have your data like on an HPC system, you typically might have a project folder somewhere on the HPC where either you have shared uh, data files or your own private files. And that's typically what you could, uh, what could be useful to bind into that container to access the data that you have there. So, yeah. Yes. Yes. So, so you might want to like take a folder from the host system that has your project data and your application is in the container. You want to have that folder appear in the container as well. And how you can do it is is via these bind mounts. So basically, you you like bind them with a tether or a elastic sling or elastic band or something. Like you bind the two places together. 
So so you take one folder and then you like you tie it up into another folder inside the container. They don't have to be the same folder. So for example, if you have like a like outside of the container, you have something in Scratch, you can have it in a different place up here in the in the container. But but what the important thing to remember is that these are the same folder. So when you bind something from outside into the container, it's not like a layer or image or something. It's the actual files. So whatever you do inside the container will affect your files in the in the actual system. So you, it is the same folder when you bind it in. So let's look at the example. Uh, how do you do these bindings? So he, here we in the diagram we see see like okay now like now we maybe start seeing like why why it might be good to look at this in this kind of blocks is that like the bind is a argument for the sub command so for the exec or run or shell or whatever so it's not a uh, it's not a argument for the obtainer command it's uh it's a uh, like an argument for the sub command so that's why it needs to be at that point like it needs to be in this area of the command when we write it and we if we uh, want to after have after the sub command basically yes yeah after the sub command like and and if we want to put a folder just inside the container we can just have like dash dash bind and then uh, the name of the folder and then that means that it will take the folder from the host system and it will bind it to the same place in the in the other system like uh, sorry in the container uh, it will bind it to the uh, same place in the container and and uh, the bind mount will if there are, or exists a folder called scratch in the container it will overwrite it so it will like it will overwrite whatever is there so so that's why you should probably put it into a place where it's not a place in the container you don't want to override like unless you want to override but usually you don't want to override the container stuff so you want to put it into a place where it's like yeah it has its uh, own own place and, and if you overwrite it can you gain it back again by unmounting or going when you run it again is it restored yes. Yes. Yeah, like the it will just like overlay it on top of the image. So again, the image thing. If we think about the layers, so what we have is that we have the image of the SIF file. What the bind man does is that it basically creates a layer on top of it, and it overrides the folders with the like when you when you go when you are in the image and you look at whatever is in slash scratch in this example. It it will try it re finds the bound bind mount and then it will ask it from the host system. It won't ask it from the SIF file. But if you do run it again and you, this time you don't have the bind mount, it will uh, try to find it from the image. So it's again like it uh, hides stuff from the image. So that's why you usually don't want it to put um, like you want to put it into places where like uh, stuff should be where you don't have something that you want yeah, to keep yeah. already yes. yeah but but like i mentioned you can also bind it to another place so in an uh, example command below here we have a uh we if, if we have a container that wants the stuff to be in in uh i, th I think it's actually um my container dot see if I have a wrong name of the container there. Uh, with a colon, you need to have scratch uh, colon. Yeah. So what we have here is that we have uh, we we bind mount slash scratch, and then we have a colon, and we have the place where we want to bind it. So. Yeah. Now, if you look at the data, yeah, yeah, we see that. Okay, this this wasn't here before. Like, and then so so it's now bound from the outside system inside the container. 
And this is very powerful tool because you can put stuff there. But you can also do like, like there was a question of how do you upgrade stuff in in the container like one one dirty trick is to do like what you can do sometimes is that if you need to modify one file in the container what you can do is that you can go inside the container copy the file from the container outside of the container and then you can modify it and bind it into the container so this won't like it won't change the container file it won't change the image but you can like put stuff inject basically stuff into right places in the container but this is like something you might <laughs> like you don't want to do it regularly but in some cases it might be necessary but in uh, emergency cases it will be very messy because you might forget that you did yes. this <laughs> yes yes it's so not it's recommended to... but it's possible yes and and regarding the folders, why why certain like in Docker world again like going back a bit to there, like in Docker world stuff is usually installed as root user, uh, like everything is run through you root user. So this this means that a lot of the images available in the internet often have a situation where stuff is installed into the home folder of the root user, and this is a bit of a problematic thing in the container image because then. In the container image, uh, uh, you might have a situation where, like, like you cannot access the root home folder, or that folder is not available for you. So it's usually a good idea to install stuff to the right places. Um, uh, in the in the building images section, there's a link to the like how the Linux file system hierarchy is organized. So usually, you want to put stuff in opt and user and user local and that sort of places uh, so that like that doesn't happen like like that you don't install stuff into home folder of a user that might not exist when you run the container but but yeah like but yeah if you have stuff that you don't have uh, like if you want stuff in the container you can use these bind files to take them take the stuff into uh, the container All right, we have a few minutes left. We can have a quick look at the hmm. questions that you have been writing. And of course, this is also hmm. a good occasion to let us know if anything needs to be improved because this is the first ever time that hmm. we are running this type of lesson. There was maybe mm -hmm. some interesting, you kind of touched this already, but there was an interesting comment here related to, where did it go? On containers on HPC systems, trying to find it. APC environmental modules are typically implemented as containers. What is the recommended way to install additional packages we're using pre-installed containers or pre-installed modules in, mm -hmm. this, in this case? Like I, I would say that the easiest way is to use that, like find out when you lo load the module, find out what is the image that that mo module points to, and then use that as a bootstrap for for creating your own container. Of course, you need to be careful not to like like when you create your own container, do not like modify the existing application there too much, or like it might break like the already existing installation but if you like install your own stuff on top of it it might um yeah work or you can just bind your own stuff into the container as well yeah uh, the other thing that you mentioned there about the fake root failures like this um fake root feature that i spoke about it it depends on the host system and the container both having a relatively new operating system so sometimes the fake root thing might fail if you're running a really you're trying to install a really old let's say ubuntu or something there are ways of mitigating this the easiest way is to like build the container in in your own let's say machine where you have pseudo rights and then move it there <laughs> like that is usually the easiest way because like during the during the building process the the obtainer needs a bit more like oomph, a bit more privileges to do the stuff that it does. And if the system doesn't provide those privileges, uh, or if the 
container combination is not correct. Like like if they if you're trying to install a really old operating system, you might run to this um, problem. So so what I would suggest is that like either add your ask your system administrators, can they make it so that it's possible to build this? Try to upgrade the container image to use a more recent operating system or install Aptainer into your own laptop or like place or ask somebody to install it for you and then run it in that place. Because usually you can get pseudo access to, let's say, your own workstation, but you cannot get it in a shared system. So yeah, like you can build it somewhere else where you have more rights and then you can like move it somewhere where you have less rights. And this is partially the reason why obtain it is like popular compared to like like in HPC systems compared to Docker because in Docker you couldn't even run it in the HPC system. Excellent. So our time is out. Thank you everyone for joining us on the streaming. Thank you, Simo, and thank you, Maiken. There is still a feedback session there in the share notes document. So please spend a couple of minutes to let us know if this was too fast, too slow, and uh, especially mention something that could be improved for the next time because we're still developing the materials. So thanks again for watching. Remember to give us some feedback and for those joining us in one hour in the Zoom, we can try all these comments, all these comments together. You can try them on your cluster and we can try to also you know, debug if something is not working in a specific system. So I see those people in one hour and thanks everyone for watching and see you next Tuesday for the last episode of DDT for HPC. Thank you. Thank you.